On November 21st, 1992, Tom Monfiles disappeared after a workplace dispute. A day later, his body was found in a pulp vat with a 50 pound weight wrapped around his neck. Over 30 years later, exactly who killed Monfiles remains a mystery. Welcome to the Monfile 6 Podcast. My name is Damon Schneider. And I'm Mike Potchel. Tonight's episode is entitled An Airtight Alibi. So the authors interviewed Zakowski and his deputy Lasse in March of 2003. And Zakowski stated on November 21st, 1992, when Mike Piaskowski called for the foreman to report Monfile's missing uh, Pi demanded that mod files be replaced. So what do you think about that word replaced? Yeah, when I first read that, I assumed that Mike meant, even though he apparently this really wasn't said, but even if it was said, let's just say it was. When I read that he said he needed Tom replaced, to me, that just meant he needed somebody to fill in for his job, like at that moment, because they needed somebody to work the machine. That's all. Indeed, yeah. Uh, Zikowski said the fact that Pi used the word quote unquote replace proves that he is guilty, uh, as using the word replaced showed that Mike Pi had prior knowledge. Do you buy that? Do I what? Do you buy that? No, I think that's insane. I can't believe he even put that as a as a um, evidence against him. Well, Zukowski used this ter- this replaced theory in his closing argument. Uh, Mike Pye told the authors, "Nothing could be further from the truth." He said that he wanted to quote unquote find Tom. Nothing about him being replaced. The state emphasized this falsehood uh, five times during the closing argument. So they thought it was a big deal. And uh, obviously the outcome of of the trial, uh, perhaps it did work with the jury. Uh, What are your thoughts on that? Do you think the jury bought that replaced theory? I don't know if that's what kind of made them convict i think they had plenty of other things that were already going against the six that made the jury decide guilty for a very long time a trophy from the monfiles case hung on the wall of zakowski's office it was a framed uh, of the news green bay uh, press gazette newspaper that had the six guilties right on the front of it So again, framed in glass and everything and put on his wall. When the authors went to interview Zikowski in 2003, that framed newspaper was missing. Do you think that's a big deal? And if so, why or why not? Well, what I took from that was just that uh, if all of that's true, to me what that says is Zikowski was extremely proud that he got the conviction, even if he got it through shady and nefarious means, and the fact that he took it down when these authors came kind of shows like he's he's trying to like hide the ego that he has about this whole thing. I took it that he had just taken it down permanently. You just think he, he took it down just for the interview with the authors? Uh, well, I don't know if he... I mean, it's it's kind of a big coincidence if he took it down when the authors happen to be there. Unless, again, maybe he had taken it down before that. But they say that he had it up there for a long time. And even if they didn't take it, even if he didn't take it down because the authors came, 
it still shows that he was so proud of getting the conviction and like that's his career defining moment let's take a listen to a short clip of Zikowski right now this is a whodunit case what where when who you've got to find out who is responsible for the death of Thomas Monfiles so the reason I wanted to play this clip is because it brings me back to the Milwaukee Film Fest when I saw Zukowski there, and he brought out, he basically explained the Monfiles case in, in this terms. He said, imagine you have a child in your house and you have cookies in the cookie jar, and then one day uh, the cookies are gone. You didn't see the child take the cookies, but you know that the child did take the cookies because no one else could have. Um, The reason I bring this up is because I think Zikowski was influenced heavily by the autopsy and and really believes that it was a homicide. And in that case, someone in the mill must have killed Tom Monfiles. Uh, Does that make sense to you? Yeah, the only thing, and I think I said this when we first talked about this many episodes back, but that analogy isn't really very comparable because there's a big difference between a pool of suspects in a single family home than there is to a mill where, like, you know, 250 people work. There's a big, much larger candidate or suspect pool, I should say, that should have been looked at better. It's not the same analogy at all. Yeah, I think there was something like 300 people in the mill the morning of November 21st. The authors speculate, what are the odds you knew someone who would give up everything in the world they had all to protect someone they scarcely knew? Let's say you could find one such person in every 100 you meet. What are the odds that you would find six like this all working together? And they state the odds for that become a trillion to one. And those odds would be like winning the Powerball twice. What did you think about that sort of analogy? Yeah, I thought that was fair. And I think that's a great point to make. The authors state that the innocence of Dale Bastian, Mike Johnson, Keith Kutzka, and Ray Moore can be proved by two people, Mike Pye and Connie Jones. However, that put both Jones and Mike Pye directly in the line of fire, and both would be accused of the murder. It was only in the nick of time by caving into the state's theory that Jones was able to escape the fate of the others. What were your thoughts on Connie Jones being involved with this and sort of changing her changing her stance at the last second? Well, I think it's understandable considering, well, and we'll get into it a little bit later, but the choices that the police gave her, you know, she didn't have much of a choice when it came to telling the truth, sticking to her, story or going along with the police's theory uh, because it's pretty likely that she would have been roped in with these other six people if she didn't change her story. Do you think that they would have gone so far as to arrest her and accuse her as being one of the people who was involved with the murder? Yeah, I, I don't see why they wouldn't. So Connie Jones was a a pulp tester at James River, and she got behind schedule on the morning of November 21st, 1992. She started doing her regular rounds around 7.20 a.m. Mike Pye saw Jones near Coop 7, and he told her about how Monfiles called the police. 
en route to her next stop, which is Coop 9, Jones passed a man in the area that seemed very distressed slash deep in thought, like something was bothering him. She told these authors he appeared to be processing. What do you think she meant by that word, processing? Well, I think what Tom had just gone through was the confrontation, right? Mm-hmm. So what I took processing as is he's he's figuring out what he's going to do. Because as we've talked about in the past, when we dove into the confrontation further, this was like, in his view, the end of things for him. Like his whole world was changing because he was found out. So I think he was like almost going through a, a breakdown mentally when Connie saw him. Memento Mori, remember you must die someday. However, your life can be remembered forever by contacting us at seasonsoflifememorials.com. We are here to teach you how to create a film about your life that can be seen at your future gravesite as well as within the obituary section of your very own newspaper. Contact, contact us today at seasonsoflifememorials.com. I wanted to bring up, Mike, um, the fact that... Uh, the video I did for my friend Bula, um, when his sister had seen it, uh, she remarked that she had never seen that side of his personality. So Bula was sort of the father figure to his other siblings because his own father had left the family. And whenever she interacted with him, it was more like sort of like he was sort of the head of the household. So she was really, really surprised um, to see him sort of being just a normal sort of young guy having fun with his friends. What can these videos do in that respect? Yeah, I think that's an interesting side to all this because I think we all have relationships like that where we only know somebody from, you know, one one side of their lives. Uh, in, in some cases where, you know, whether it's people we work with or uh, some fa certain family members, you know, cousins, people like that, that maybe you kind of distance yourselves from as, as you got older. Uh, I think these, these videos can really enlighten people, give them a full picture of who the person really was. And I think a lot of people take uh, joy in 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 learning about that uh because i i can identify with the story you just said i mean my um i have a cousin that that died a couple of years ago and i hadn't been in contact with him in years and they didn't do a video or anything so i still really don't know what was going on in his life but it would have been nice to have something like that because as i just said i really don't know what he was up to uh we had just kind of known each other as kids and after that i had i mean i hadn't seen him in over 10 years uh, before he passed away so definitely can understand what these videos would do in that regard and i think that's just another highlight and advantage to doing these that we haven't covered yet, where I think a lot of people, as you've just described, they appreciate seeing the full picture of a family member or a friend or whoever it is, where they just maybe would have heard stories uh, uh, or heard about the other people in their lives, but they just never really got to see it. Uh, and obviously from your video that you made for Bula, you had the photos and you had interviews from people. So it really kind of makes people, I think, appreciate the life that uh, that person led and really appreciate that the video was made in their honor. And we're back. So when Jones entered Coop 9, she saw Bastion Johnson, Johnson and Kutzka. In Coop 9, Jones listened to the tape of Monfiles, when she asked 
who made the call. Kutska pointed out the window and said, that's him right over there in the blue hat. To Jones' surprise, it was the same man she had seen a minute earlier who had looked deep in thought. After logging data, Jones left Coop 9. She wanted to get a closer look at Monfiles, and she specifically looked for him, but she could no longer find him. The only other person she could find was Mike Pye, who was still in Coop 7. Pye was wondering what Jones thought of the tape. And then Mike Pye then went to Coop 9, passing through Mike Monfile's work area, but he did not see him there. So what do you think about Connie Jones being sort of the last person to ever see Monfile's and also going to look for him but not being able to find him? In relation to, um, you know, at this time, the bubbler scenario is supposed to be going on, according to the police, right? Yeah, yeah. And as we can see, Connie interacted with a lot of people during this time period. Most of them were members of the Monfile Six. Uh, no one mentioned anything about a confrontation or anything about Monfiles, everything being mentioned about Monfiles is they don't know where he was. So there's nothing here about a confrontation. Yeah, so if if the events unfolded the way that Connie Jones stated originally, then most of the Monfile 6 are accounted for. They're just in Coop 9, sort of talking about the tape. Jones then went back to the pulp lab where she met Ray Moore and she told him about the tape. Why do you think that Connie told Ray about the tape and do you think she regrets that to this day? I have no idea what she thinks about that, but I think I was wondering the same thing about why she told him. And I, I think really just this was like, a huge deal for everybody at that mill. And it was like the, the big gossip uh, topic of the day. So everybody was telling anybody about it. Yeah, I think that's right too. I think it was just, it, it was the big gossip event of the day. She suggested that Ray go to Coop 9 to hear it. Just as Mike Pye entered Coop 9, Ray Moore came in. Moore listened to the tape and asked, who is this Monfiles fellow? What did you think about that? Just in fact that if that's true that he said, who is this Monfiles fellow? I mean, you're not going to like participate in the murder of someone you don't know, right? Yeah, you, you, you certainly would think so. I mean, he certainly wouldn't share the 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 passionate anger that uh, Kutska had probably for turning him in. Yeah, it's just hard to believe that Ray Moore was the one accused of, you know, shaking the tape in front of Monfile's face. You know, like, if he really did say, who is this Monfile's fellow? Like, he doesn't even know who he is. So Kutska motioned to the window saying, He's in the blue hat, but Monfiles is no longer anywhere in sight. Mike Pye then left to go back to work. So Moore and Kutska then went to look for Monfiles, but didn't find him, ending their search at Coop 7. Do you think that had anything to do with Moore being roped into this, into the... Um, being one of the Monfiles six, the fact that he went with Kutska right around the time that Monfiles went missing. Yeah, I do. I think just that he was associated with Kutska at that time. Unfortunately, yeah, he was roped into all this because of that. So the back tender, which again, the back tender is sort of the number two position on the machines. 
uh, was Dennis Servais, and he was in Coop 7. Mike Pye then entered Coop 7 and asked Servais if he had seen Monfiles. Servais said he had not seen him. Servais verifies the sequence of events, saying that Moore and Kutzka entered Coop 7 between 7.45 and 7.50, and then Mike Pye came in a minute later. So again, like we just stated, it's you know the fact that Moore was with Kutzka at this really important time is probably what doomed him, unfortunately. Dale Bastian, who was also wearing a blue hat, stopped in Coop Seven, and someone said, "Is that Mon Files?" Uh, someone else in Coop Seven said, "Wrong blue hat." What do you think the fact that they were both wearing blue hats? Do you think that was just a coincidence or do you think that maybe the blue hat was some sort of work issued blue hat? I I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> it just seems like a lot of people are wearing blue hats. Yeah, I don't know. Bastion teased Mike Pye and Servais of like getting shorthand pay. So what I get what is shorthand pay again? Oh, so uh if Monfiles hadn't shown up as we've talked about, you really need four people. I mean you can get by with three, but you really it'd be great if you had all four to do the turnovers. So uh if somebody doesn't show up, um uh, they divide that person's pay among the three that are there to do the job. So Bastion then headed for the ice machine where he chatted with a supervisor, a Pat Ferrero. Uh, Mike Pye then paged Ferrero, uh, telling him Monfiles was missing and to come to Coop 7 because, quote-unquote, serious shit was going down. So that's a direct quote I think that people agree on. Um, how do you think that affected the Mod Files 6 getting into the situation that they got into? What do you mean go into that question more? Uh, the fact that Mike Pye used the, used the phrase serious shit was going down. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, with when Tom disappeared... After this confrontation, I think they they knew that something was definitely wrong. I mean, it, I don't know if that had ever happened before where somebody just disappears from their job, where they just walk off the job. So I think they they knew that something was off. Could the police have taken that phrase as though something violent was taking place or had taken place? I mean, they they may have. Uh, we know that after we just talked about Zakowski focusing so heavily on the word replaced, they can, they can turn anything into anything incriminating. So I certainly see how they might have viewed that as a, a sign, but I don't know if they did. So Ray Moore began to return to work then. Uh, he stopped by the lab to tell Connie Jones that Monfiles was still missing, and he still didn't know who he was. Jones recalls that the time was about 8 a.m., about 20 minutes after she had first seen Moore and told him about the tape. The observations of Jones and Mike Pye completely account for the whereabouts of the Monfiles 6 when Tom went missing with the exception of Mike Hearn. How did the police get around this then? And so the authors state that they implicated Mike Pye as being a part of it, and they persuaded Jones that her memory uh, had been inaccurate about the timeline. So what do you think the police basically, the authors are saying... They have this problem of Mike Pye and, and Connie Jones being having these recollections of all the Monfile Six being accounted for, and so their solution is to accuse Mike is 
like Pi as being a part of the murder itself. Why do you think they did that? What's remembered lives. Losing someone precious from our lives is the most painful event that one can endure. Seasons of Life Memorials is dedicated to making sure the person you lost is never forgotten. We work with you to help you craft a film about your loved one's life that can be viewed at the grave site. We can also help you create a film about your very own life that can be viewed in the obituary section of your hometown newspaper. Imagine that, your friends, relatives, and neighbors viewing your own unique story and how your life truly did matter. Visit our website, seasonsoflifememorials.com, and follow us on social media today to start viewing what we can do for you. Well, they needed it to fit their theory, but... Uh... Again, I think there's two other things that are going on here. They, We know from the get-go, they really the main focus was Keith Kutzka, and everybody else that was convicted was kind of just happenstance bonus that they threw in because they were linked with him at the time. So it was really about Kutzka. And then also, just more Zakowski-related, I really believe that, and this is my personal view, just from what I've seen, prosecutors sometimes, even though they're 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 there to convict guilty people, I think sometimes they get more hung up on just winning the case rather than actually getting the right person. And I think that's what is going on here. I don't think they really wanted to spend too much time on investigating because they were running into dead ends. So they just kept going with this because they wanted to win. That's my view of all this. So the police and prosecution again at the, around this time, they started to threaten Connie Jones. Uh, they looked somehow where they were able to gain access to her bank account. And they saw uh, there had recently been a big deposit of money. So a week before the trial, Jones conceded that the police must be right about her misplaced memory. However, uh, in turn, the authors state that a probate court had recently had recently uh, placed a deceased relative's money into Jones's account for distribution at a date, later date. And so that's what accounted for that large deposit. However, Detective Winkler claimed that the money was a bribe from Moore. Do you think there was any way to clear that up? Yeah, I was actually going to say, if they were able to look at her bank account and see a deposit was made, then they should have been able to see where it came from. And they would have seen that it wasn't from Moore or connected with him in any way. That's easily verifiable if the probate court ordered her to deposit it. They could look into that. Yeah, that's that's a strange element for sure. You think that they that would have been done? Well, and I'll add too, there's another... I don't know if this would even have gone to the defense attorneys because this this deposit really didn't have anything to do with them unless I, I could see Ray Moore's attorney if, if he even knew about this. But that would be a time to to refute that. You know, I mean, obviously this this didn't get to court, this this deposit thing. But. I wonder if Connie Jones had representation because her attorney should have been able to present this to refute this um, accusation. In 2005, the author sat down with Connie Jones for a four-hour interview. She was retired from the mill, but she described how she she had been bumped out of the lab and forced to work as the fourth hand on the now infamous Paper Machine 7, that's Machine Mon Files had last been on. 
So it's implied by the authors that uh, the office, the management at James River basically demoted her uh, from the pulp lab to being fourth hand on Paper Machine 7. Uh, is that the way you took it? Well, I definitely took it that uh, for some reason she lost her job, which sounded like a much better job than she ended up retiring at. So, yeah, I don't know why she was demoted. Maybe it was because of her involvement in this case. I don't know, but it's definitely something to to look into. Yeah, to go from the sort of the head of the pulp lab to um, fourth hand seems like quite a drop. During her interview, she stated that all the men she'd seen on November 21st were in Coop 9 and that all their whereabouts are accounted for. The authors lay out a time by timeline within the chapter. Uh, it was very detailed, and it clearly shows everyone was accounted for during the supposed bubbler scenario. It also underscores that Connie Jones and Mike Pye were eyewitnesses as to where everyone was the morning of November 21st, 1992. So the authors include a few words from Mike Pye where he begins, uh, even though I know that he's innocent, I personally blame Keith Kutzka for everything. I don't think he hurt Monfiles, but his actions led to Monfiles' death as he put into motion the events. His careless actions ruined my life in the lives of countless others. He took nine years out of my life. He turned the last years of my father and grandmother's lives into hell on earth. He kept me from attending both of their funerals. He caused me to miss the marriage of my daughter, Jenny. He prevented me from repairing my own marriage. He cost me my livelihood, my home, my savings, and all my personal possessions. He ruined my pension, my social security benefits, and my plans for a decent retirement. Trust, trust me when I say I have no love for Keith Kutzka, but we still do have one thing in common. He too is innocent of this crime. So what are you what did what are your thoughts on Mike Pice, his personal view of Keith Kutzka and everything that he had done to him? Yeah, when I read that I I'm not going to harp on him too much because obviously he went through all this. I did not. I can see why he would be angry completely. I don't think it's fair, though, to blame Kutzka for this. I, I, I get that he did set in motion the whatever happened to Tom. To me, the real people to look at for this like he talks about missing out on all these family things well to me that's all Zakowski, that's all the green bay police department that's randy winkler and it's the jury that he should really be upset with because kutska didn't do this intentionally you know he obviously had no intention of having something happen to tom and that makes a big difference whereas Zakowski. And the police, they knew exactly what they were doing here. There's a big difference there, and I think that should be recognized. New episodes of the Monfile 6 podcast drop every other Friday. Please join us again. Thanks for listening. recently lost a loved one and want to hold on to their memory forever? We create individual and unique video-based obituaries that will allow anyone reading your local newspaper or visiting the gravesite to view the video and your memories of the loved one. 
Contact us today at seasonsoflifememorials.com. 